You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors, All right, everybody, that music means we are back. It is time once again for Education Wednesday here on the network. And how do we kick things off? Well, as always, with the Premier Options Educational Program. Yes, it is time once again for Options Boot Camp, what the cool kids call the old OBC. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com. As well as, of course, from the ever inspiring, ever educational network upon which so many of you folks are binging. A couple of reminders here at the top of the show. Hey, if you like what you hear, make sure you do keep rating and reviewing. It is clearly more important than ever in these troubled times. <laughs> People are discovering the show en masse these days. And we want to thank all of you for helping to make that happen. Again, we've been doing this show for. Over a decade, we just had the 200-plus episode spectacular, but it's always fun to have new folks discovering the show, learning about options. It benefits everyone at the end of the day. So if you do like what you hear, do keep rating and reviewing, just like our friend here did, Elk Trout 77 And we realized, you know, we have so many reviews, you get a lot of new ones, but also we have reviews going back over a decade. <laughs> Sometimes we're not being fair to those folks. We should give them some love, too. This one actually came back in April of 2019, so pre-pandemic. They said five stars. I think this is iTunes. Keep the boot camp alive. Double exclamation point. Excellent content, guys. Thanks for all of your effort putting this together. But don't quit on us now. Keep the content coming. Double exclamation point. Yeah, I think that was back in the hiatus period right around it there of boot camp. And never fear Elk Trout and everyone else who's listening out there. Boot camp is back. It's in your ear holes every week. So don't you worry. We're not giving up on you folks out there. It's like you haven't given up on us. So thanks for everyone who takes the time to rate and review. Of course, if you're just listening to Boot Camp, you're missing out. You're missing out on a ton of great stuff. So make sure you subscribe to the full network wherever you get this. And then, of course, if you need even more in your lives, and hey, who doesn't? These are crazy times. We could all use a bit of a helping hand. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. get you access to our exclusive pro podcast feed where you're going to get a couple of extra shows, including great pro Q&As. We've had some great ones in there recently. There's pretty much 70-odd in there on the feed. Now you can check out 140-odd episodes in the feed total. Uh, so great pro Q&As. You can go back and check out everything we've done in there. And, of course, participate in all the new ones, as well as Options Oddities every Friday, breaking down the week's worth of weird trades and putting a few on of our own. Sometimes they win. Sometimes they lose. They're fun either way. And then, of course, live access to this, everything else we do throughout the week. And... Great giveaways like we're going to do in a few minutes here. But in order to do the giveaway, I need my compatriot here, the black-hatted one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring. Mr. P, welcome back to the show, sir. How are things in the land of MTM? Mark, it is wonderful in the land of MTM. It is always wonderful. There are unicorns jumping over rainbows. Uh, there, there are leprechauns at the end of the rainbow with pots of gold. It's wonderful. <laughs> and I've been to Frankfurt. I must have missed the uh, the section that had the unicorns and the rainbows. I saw the truck stop. 
Uh, I saw the old abandoned Charlie horse. I didn't see the unicorn. I must have taken the wrong turn there. You got to you got to show me the unicorns and rainbow street. That sounds uh, pretty fun. But speaking of unicorns and rainbows and everything being idyllic, Dan, we're spreading out the love this week. We've been giving away our pro trading crates to our pro members. We do it every month there. It's a fun thing. We put together this whole big thing. People have been tweeting about it. They're getting their packages. They're all excited. People have been asking how they can buy them. They can't. You can't buy these pro trading crates. The only way to get them, listeners, is by becoming a member of theoptionsider.com slash pro, and you get your name in the hat. And then if you're lucky, your name will be drawn. Perhaps that day is today because Dan, once again, we are bringing the love to Options Bootcamp. We usually do these in the option block, but I thought, you know what? Let's spread it out. Let's let everybody have some fun giving away some fabulous prizes. So, Dan, I'm going to fire up our random number generator here. Scott, here, okay, there it goes. It's going. It's flickering on my screen right now. It's got all the member numbers and their names associated with it right here. And then when you tell me, sir, when the mood hits you, whenever it could be now, could be two weeks from now, I guess. That'd be kind of a long time to wait, but hopefully during the, the run of this show, <laughs> maybe in the next minute. <laughs> you tell me when to stop and I will hit the stop button and that will identify this month's winner of the pro trading crate. So Mr. Dan, I know that's a lot of power. It's a lot of responsibility. You know what they say with great power comes great responsibility. You now have both, sir. So use it wisely and pick our winner this month, sir. So like, like I should count to a certain number in my head or I should do it later in the show. Like what? However you want to do it, sir. Tell me if you're going to do it later in the show, let me know so I can just keep this thing running in the background. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I have a squirrel. Uh, wait, sorry about that. Short attention span. And so <laughs> if I if I wait until later in the show, like we might not pick. You somebody. probably will forget about it. Yes, I will forget about it. So stop. Oh. There we go. Man, I have good reflexes. I caught it right at the second you said that. All right, here we go. All right, let's see. What number does that, who does that correspond to? That is Neil, Neil Krishnan. So congratulations to you, Neil. You are the winner of the most recent pro trading crate. Our producers will reach out to you via your member email address there, ask you some questions. You get, so you get a few choices in your crate. The rest of it is bespoke. It's put together by us. You're going to get some great educational book offerings. You get to choose amongst those. Maybe Mr. P's will be one of those book offerings you could choose from. You also will need your shirt size. You get some exclusive gear from us. And then the rest, I'm looking at a mountain of stuff right here. We're going to cram as much cool, exotic, one-off goodies from the world of options into that box as is humanly possible. So look forward to that, Neil. Congratulations. Thanks to being a member. For everybody else out there, thanks for playing we're giving another one of those away not too long from now. we got to give away the November crate pretty soon as well. As we keep on rolling, listeners, it is time for the Mail Block. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, everybody, welcome to the Mail Call, the portion of the show where you guys take the range, your questions, your comments. A lot of your comments and questions and things on social media have been to do with the crate, people getting them, people loving them, people having a good time tweeting what their contents were. So if you want to check out what some of the some of the crates have contained, listeners, these mystery bespoke boxes, check out our Twitter over there at options is the place to go. And of course, if you want to join the party, the optionsinsider.com slash pro or dare I say it, slash secret club for the cool kids. And speaking of secret clubs, Mr. Dan, they don't get much more secret, much more exclusive than the MTM community out there. And sometimes that community rises to the surface with awesome, inspiring, brain-teasing questions that you want to share in your market taker question of the week. So, Mr. P, sir, what rose to the surface this week? What was amazing you want to share with our listeners? You know what? I was I was talking with uh, one of the folks on our team here. I'm actually uh, revamping a presentation that we're having on uh, on Saturday. It's a it's a training webinar on momentum trades, and <laughs> and I was thinking about um, well, it's a long roundabout story. But I was thinking about poker, and I do get asked occasionally, "Is trading just gambling?" And, um, you know, like there are a number of similarities about it, but good trading is not gambling. Um, much like good poker playing is not 
I mean, there's still some gambling involved there, but you know, like the more skill you have, the more things you learn, the more skill you apply, the less and less like gambling it is. You know, gambling and trading are statistical endeavors, but um, when like to me, pure gambling, you have no control over the outcome. When you have control over the outcome, um, it, it, it becomes a different thing besides gambling. And, you know, this is uh, obviously not to say you have control over what a stock does, but you have control over how you act and react to it. And, um, and you know, that, that ends up being the skill of the trader. Unless you're Dan in that land of unicorn and rainbows. Then, sir, you have control <laughs> over all of the fun stocks out there. You know what else you folks have control over, listeners? It's your answers of our questions of the week, our many and myriad and head-scratching audience polls. Last week, we asked you folks a fun one. Both Meta and Amazon are trading around $100 right now, which raises the question, very simple one last week, which one would you rather buy? And, Dan, we gave them three choices to make it fun. We gave them Amazon, Facebook, and neither. What do you think our audience chose, sir? No cheat. So let's see here. I would say that they chose neither. Uh, it's kind of tough. You know, <laughs> like the tech stocks have been getting beat up a lot lately because as interest rates rise, you know, that's just gets worse and worse for tech stocks because they're growth stocks. You know, they need to borrow money at low rates in order to, you know, in order to grow. So that's tough. Um, oh, geez. It's hard, though, because they've been beaten down so much that maybe they, you know, uh, I mean, they're probably poised for a comeback. And we've talked about my feelings on Meta in the long run that I think it's probably a screaming buy in the long run. Um, oh, geez. I don't know. I'll say neither. What, what, what was it, Mark? Our audience disagreed with you wholeheartedly. 68.1% going the Amazonian route. And only 18.1% saying Facebook and 13.8% going neither, Dan. And apparently right now that was the wrong choice because Meta has turned around. They're back up over 100. They both dipped down into uh, the below 90s. I think Meta got down to around $88 before they announced all these layoffs. And uh, the street loves a good layoff, Dan, because the stock is back up <laughs> 12 and a half bucks over the past five days. So back up to one oh two and a half dollars So in the near term, Meta is the winner. 86 and a half is where Amazon is trading right now. So Amazon has continued selling off. So it has moved in the wrong direction. I think long term, I could see why people maybe would have a little bit of distrust in, in Meta versus Amazon. People are going to keep buying stuff, maybe at a slower rate. But uh, say, Lobby, I could certainly see that one. Fast forward to this week, Dan. We have a more far reaching question this week. We have been asking you guys questions, taking your pulse all year long. And it's always fascinating to see how you're thoughts and opinions evolve over time we first asked this question back in march of this year and at the time 56 percent of you said you were bargain hunting now we're asking it again we're revisiting this question and the question quite simply is there's so many factors weighing on the markets right now you have a legion of them you got crypto banging on things now you got the fed spooking everybody you got earnings you got so many macro factors inflation everything going on out there we said, how are you adjusting your trading style? We gave you four choices. You're reducing your overall equity holdings, so pairing things back, maybe stepping into a little bit of cash. Maybe you're buying a little bit of crypto. <laughs> Interesting timing <laughs> for that, that choice. <laughs> uh, you're bargain hunting, so you're doing a little bit of the old BTFD in, so you're buying some dips out there. Or you're getting defensive, and you're strapping down and hedging your positions. Mr. Dan, if you have a choice, have at it. And then B, what do you think our audience is voting for, sir? You know, I mean, I think I'm I, I'm going to vote for bargain hunting <clears throat> and um, I think maybe our 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 flock would be voting for that as well. Although I was wrong the first time, but you were horribly wrong. Let's see if you can redeem yourself, sir. And I, I don't have a pulse on this one. Oh, I haven't looked myself. Uh, let's look together. Oh, yes. Bargain hunting. You you have redeemed yourself, sir, Dan. 36.7%. It's not quite the overwhelming majority that our other one was, but a little bit north of a third right now saying bargain hunting. It shows kind of how evenly split the audience is, with the exception of crypto. No love for crypto <laughs> right now. 36.7. I wonder why. 36.7% on the old BTFD and right now. 
30% saying you're just peering things back. You're peering back your equity holdings, maybe to get ready to do some BTFD. And uh, 23.3% saying you're straight up hedging your positions right now. And only 10%, the lone 10%, nibbling away at some crypto. Speaking of crypto, <laughs> let's just get into this, Dan. It's our first question here. This comes from Fetterman. I like that handle, Fetterman. Sounds uh, like a like a Seinfeld character. He walks in the door like Newman, Fetterman. <laughs> Fetterman says, hey, guys, loving the show. Well, right back at you, Fetterman. We love you and all of our listeners take the time to write in. He says, not sure if this is the right program on the network for this question, but OBC is my favorite, so I sent it to you. Well, there you go. If we're your favorite, we will endeavor to answer it out there, even though it is crypto. So probably crypto rundown would have been your choice. But hey, who are we to dissuade you from writing it? He said, did you see the chaos in the crypto markets yesterday after the FTX Binance quote deal? It seemed really shady to me, and it seemed to underscore Dan's concerns about the crypto markets. What are your thoughts? Am I just wearing a tinfoil hat? Either way, you guys are the best. Well, thank you, Fetterman. All of our listeners, such nice folks out there. You folks are really the best. So I'd be love giving you guys prizes here on the show. Uh, yeah, it was kind of hard to miss this news yesterday, listeners. And if you're listening to this maybe after the fact, or you just missed it, you're under a rock for whatever reason, FTX, one of the larger crypto, they call themselves exchanges. They're really brokers, listeners. They're brokers slash exchanges, which is a problem in and of itself. Don't get me started on that. But you have FTX and you also have Binance, two of the largest, certainly offshore uh, crypto venues. Let's call them out there. Uh, FTX got themselves in a little bit of hot water of late. Uh, They have this FTT token that they've issued. The CEO also has a hedge fund that primarily owns a bunch of this token. So there's a lot of double dealing and Things that are kind of untoward, and that probably wouldn't fly if you were here in a regulated U.S. exchange. <laughs> you don't see the CEO of a CME, for example, running a hedge fund on the side that owns a bunch of its own stock slash token and then using that to finance collateral for deals and stuff. The whole thing, it just stinks, quite frankly. Binance was an original investor in FTX, which is also weird because they were also competitors. They seem to have had a bit of a falling out of late over the prospect of regulation in the crypto space. Uh, FTX kind of running toward it, Binance going the more DeFi, decentralized route. There was an article recently that kind of questioned some of the liquidity going on with this FTX and that hedge fund they have as a result. It crushed that token, that FTT token. Binance has a bunch of that token as a result of deals they've done in the past. They said, hey, we want out of this thing. So in a very kind of Machiavellian move, that CEO of Binance said, hey, we're going to liquidate this thing. So Binance or FTX, I should say, offered to buy it for somewhere around $22. That that began the just selling frenzy on that FTT token, which, as it turns out, was the primary collateral for a lot of the balance sheet there at FTX, which is also a problem. You should have your reserves. You should have your, your company money and your customer money all segmented. There's a question mark over whether that even happened there, whether they were double dealing with customer money. Uh, Binance came in yesterday, said we're going to buy this thing, but... It wasn't a binding offer. It was just like, hey, we maybe, we maybe we'll buy this thing. We're going to look at the books. Sounds like from this morning, they looked at the books and they did not like what they see. So they backed off. So this deal may not be happening now. So there's a whole bunch of questions swirling right now about the crypto space, about decentralized finance versus centralized. A lot of the crypto folks are saying this is a great example of why you shouldn't have centralized crypto because this kind of stuff can happen. Shady dealings can happen and shady actors can screw up the whole thing. A lot of other people are saying, well, look at the US versions of FTX and Binance. They're all regulated. They're separate entities. They have to list their reserves. This stuff isn't happening with the US regulated version. So people seem to be very polarized on this issue, which isn't surprising. It's a very polarizing thing. A long way around, Dan, to Mr. Fetterman asking us, uh, have you seen this? And then what are your thoughts on this, Dan? And also, he wants to know, does this underscore your concerns about the crypto market, sir? Yeah, man, there's a lot of, jeez, uh, man, I don't even know what to call it. Not nepotism, uh, incestuousism. Um, Incestuous is a good adjective for it, yes. <laughs> Shady dealings, also a good description. Yeah, uh, what are they, or, uh, commingling of funds, uh, um um, conflicts of interest. There's, yeah, it's messed. I mean, I don't know, man, you know, the crypto space is super weird. Like it started out and some people thought it was weird and some people were like, Oh yeah, this is great. And you know, then it goes up 
a bunch and comes down and everybody thinks, oh, it's great. It's a new, th-, you know, like just the back and forth emotional logic to it is so crazy. Um, but when it all comes down to it, most of these coins and exchanges and all that is just like some dude in his mom's basement just made it up. <laughs> and, you know, like it doesn't, it hasn't been required to follow the laws of, you know, things that, uh, you know, like it, it's not under the jurisdiction of places, uh, of organizations that keep people safe from getting ripped off. Like, you know, you see these rug pulls all the rug pulls all the time um, where this currency just doesn't exist anymore, even though it did yesterday. Where is it? I don't know. It's just not there. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the one thing I've always kind of harped on is clearing, but you know, you brought up a really good point too, where it's both a broker and an exchange and it's financed by the currency that somebody made up so that they could pay for the exchange they made up. I don't know. It's just, I mean, if this were a, like like a, a stock situation that was governed by the SEC, you would say, holy moly, this is shady. But we kind of have been conditioned to give this sort of scenario a whole bunch more forgiveness because it's, you know, just this open source coding. And, you know, of course, the people who are creating these things have great intentions and maybe they do. But yeah, if this were a corporation doing stuff like this, you would be like, what the heck? And they'd be being investigated. I, I, I don't know. It's, um, it's tough, you know, caveat M tour. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying crypto should be or shouldn't be regulated, but you got to be super careful and, and not be naive about this stuff. Especially when you're buying these proprietary tokens, not very liquid, like these FTTs and others. We saw this with Luna already, listener. This is a not quite the same scenario. Obviously, that was a stable coin, but still, these kind of things are just good reminders to do your due diligence. Yeah, and I've never been comfortable with the whole we are an exchange, but we're also a broker. None of, none of these firms call themselves brokers because it sounds way cooler to call yourself an exchange, right? Much more of an imprimatur of a, of a financial entity if you are an exchange versus a broker. But they're all they're getting customers. They have custody of customer assets, which is obviously an issue here with FTX. What is their reserve situation? All these questions that you really should have a, a firewall between that. And so that's, that's been one of my issues with the crypto space from from day one obviously people out there who are hardcore on the whole DeFi side think the decentralized finance can can take care of all of that the chain can take care of all of that and maybe this called me the cynic out of there but i'm a little skeptical and issues like this are good reminders and maybe we do need a little bit more oversight in that space because the u.s entities are still running apparently at least for now they don't seem to have the same issues they posted their reserves we know they're not double dealing in customer capital at least for now so, yeah, this is just a, a bad reminder, unfortunately, though, of the dark side of crypto it doesn't change my outlook on, let's say, things like ETH or things like that. But they are they have taken quite a hit out there. So if you like long term of these crypto assets, maybe you view this as an opportunity. This is a buying opportunity for you. Solana got that is cut down 25, 30 percent, something like that. So if you're a believer in, in that, that asset out there, then maybe this is a buying opportunity for you. But uh, intriguing stuff. And, yeah, there, we have certainly not heard the last of this. Doesn't seem like we've even heard the last of if this deal is going to happen or not, it doesn't seem like it is right now. And it does seem like the Binance folks really uh, cutting the legs out from under the uh, the FTX folks there with some of their maneuvers, which is uh, interesting. Very Machiavellian kind of reminds me of Schwab cutting the legs out of TD when they got rid of commissions. <laughs> they knew TD was much more reliant on commissions than they were. And as a result, they were able to buy TD for pennies on the dollar. So uh, some aggressive moves, shall we say, out there in the brokerage space on the crypto side. But yeah, this is this is unfortunate. Never like to see liquidity issues. Never like to see issues with customer funds. Uh, let's hope all this is sorted out before more people lose money out there. Uh, let's go out to uh, to the world of options, you know, our actual purview. <laughs> Blame Fetterman. Uh, Dino has a question. Dino wants to know, why does Dan only trade short butterflies? Aren't they also a good way to minimize the outlay on a long spread position and take advantage of skew. All right, Dan, explain yourself to Dino. Why are you only trading short flies? What are you doing, sir? 
Well, I mean, look, you know, I, I, I don't have any hard, fast rules about anything. I do have some, you know, rules of thumb, some guidelines. And the reason why I typically don't, um, <clears throat> buy or well, buy iron butterflies or short regular butterflies. So like basically we're talking about the guts, you know, I'm typically short the guts and long the wings. The reason I don't do it the other way is because what you effectively have then is a straddle, but you limit your profit potential and, you know, you, you limit your cash outlay on it a little bit, you know, not a, not a lot usually, but a little bit, but then you really limit the profit potential. So, I mean, I don't know, nine times out of 10, if I'm looking at a situation like that and, and I will model that trade out sometimes. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I might've traded one like that during the last 12 months, probably one, but almost always I can find a better way to trade it that just ends up making more more sense, you know, is a better risk reward and or better probability of success. So, you know, it's not like I'm morally opposed to it. It's just that usually the, you know, the 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 math or the um, you know, the the research says I should be doing something different that makes more sense. Maybe the terminology is what's catching people up here because you're still you're paying for your butterfly. You're doing a debit. You're buying the in the money or closer to the meteor option. Then you're selling what you're terming the guts, and that's the two, right? And then you're buying one. So you still are buying the fly, I think, maybe the way he sees it. But you're you're thinking of it around the guts, and that's how you're queuing. Is, is that what's going on here, Dan? Yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah, you know, a lot can get lost in translation when we're talking options. What I'm specifically talking about is the guts. Normally, I'm short the guts and it's like a theta trade. Although, you know, I'm also a fan of directional butterflies. Been having a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of interest here at Market Taker with directional time spreads, which is, you know, little different, but there's some similarities. So yes, I, I prefer shorting the guts most of the time. And I usually can't find a good case for buying the guts. Yes. I think, I think you're talking about the same thing here. What you mean by long is that you're buying the spread and Dan is buying the spread too. He's just queuing around it the old fashioned way. Some old school butterfly traders think of them this way. They think they queue around the guts. I think a lot of newer retail type traders think about, Hey, I'm I'm paying for this. I'm buying an in the money. I'm paying a debit for this. this. I'm long the spread when technically you are short the guts, which is, of course, the the two section of the fly, the middle section, which we used to call on the floor, the guts. That's the guts. So whatever you're doing around the guts, uh, some people like to think that's what you're doing to the spread. But I think you're both talking about the same thing, Dino. So, yeah, and they are a good way. You're right. They are a good way to minimize your outlay on a long spread position and also take advantage of skew. That is correct. That's exactly what Dan's doing. That's what I like to use butterflies for. So, yes, I think we're all on the same page. We're talking around the same thing here. Let's go out to Elite with two threes, trying to be pretty clever with their handle. Elite wants to know, have the OBC crew ever traded a Jade Lizard? What are your thoughts on them? Jade Lizard. That is not a strategy. <laughs> that uh, I have come across that really anyone has ever really asked us about here on the network. So I, I have never traded one of these. I think this is one of, uh, I think Saznov over at Tasty Trade. I think he, this is something he talks about over there. I, I, I've never really encountered these. Dan, this is the kind of trade that, or the kind of name I should say, that just reeks to me of someone trying too hard to come up with a cool name for an option strategy. <laughs> have you encountered these in the wild, sir? You know, like a couple of years ago, somebody <clears throat> mentioned one, like in passing, like as if I was supposed to know what it was. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? Oh, you know, Jay, everybody knows what a Jay was. I'm like, no, everybody does not know what that is. But apparently it's a tasty trade thing. I think maybe Liz and Jenny came up with that one. And, and, I, and I looked it up one day and I knew what it was for about five days. And then I've since forgotten uh, so no, I have not traded one or at least not knowingly. So, um, I have been known to trade option strategies that don't necessarily have a name, or at least I don't know the name of them. It just happens to fit what I'm trying to do. Uh, so, Hey, maybe I did, but, um, 
yeah, it's it's a little bit of an esoteric thing, I think. Yeah, I think the fact that neither Dan nor I are familiar with these should tell you all you really need to know about <laughs> how prevalent a quote unquote jade lizard is. <laughs> Iron Butterfly. I thought Iron Butterfly was as ridiculous as it got, but uh, Jade Lizard may be, may be vying for the most ridiculous uh, option strategy name. <laughs> Let's go on out to uh, this one here from PLC to take us home today. PLC says, it seems like keeping your money in cash and just selling 10% out of the money spy puts is a great way to generate income and offset inflation in these markets. And if you get the spy put to you, it's at a great level. Right now, a one month spy, 330 and 335 puts are still decently juicy. Is this approach just too simplistic? Well, no, we talked about this before. Who is this? This is PLC. Uh, this is a, certainly a reasonable approach. If you're maybe, we always talk about BTFD in here. That's our question of the week right now. Maybe that's one way to go about this, listeners, is to draw your line in the sand by selling the puts. And then if you pick a level you like, in this case, PLC chose the uh, 335 puts. So roughly 10% out of the money puts. And uh, he likes that level. I thought we'd check into those. I pulled those up right before showtime here, Dan. And the December 335 put in Spy was trading for around two bucks. So not bad, not terrible. Obviously, if you're going to do, let's say you do a 10 lot. So that's a lot. You're talking a thousand shares of Spy. So that's $335,000 you have to put away. That's probably more than most people are going to do. But if you do that, you're talking $2,000 worth of income. So you're talking somewhere in the ballpark of about a half a percent. So again, you're not talking orders of magnitude riches out here. But if your goal is to try to offset some inflation, get paid for working your limit orders in SPY, and to maybe pick up some SPY at lower levels where you feel more comfortable, and I've seen worse. That works out to a ballpark of somewhere around a 6% for a year. Now, obviously, this caveats to that. Obviously, these happen to be the D. So this is about actually five weeks if you add it all up. So it's a little bit more. The actual monthly probably be a little bit less than $2 if you're selling those every month. Also, it's going to vary on the vol. It's going to vary on the skew. A lot of different factors are going to make these puts more or less rich if you do this month after month. But I've certainly seen worse strategies, Dan, than collecting 6% roughly and also getting in at SPY at somewhere at a lower level where you're more comfortable. What do you think for uh, PLC? You like this approach, sir? Well, I mean, <clears throat> it depends on your objective. It depends on your outlook. It depends on your timing. I mean, if you were doing that, you know, at the top of the market, you'd be underwater pretty good right now, right? I'm um, assuming he's starting from scratch right now. That's what I'm assuming. Yeah. I mean, starting from scratch right now, um, and I mean, in the long run, I think for sure uh, it's it's a probably a great approach in the long run, but in the short run, um, well, it might not be uh, right. Like you could end up taking some heat on that because, you know, I mean, the Fed got very aggressive with interest rates, which everybody was a fan for at first. Everybody was like, oh my God, you know, why are you waiting so long for this? Jeez Louise, stop the inflation. And then they, once they started late, they kind of kept going and it takes a year for those numbers to factor in. And so um, it's not a crazy thought that we end up not getting a soft landing at all, but a hard landing and then the Fed having raised interest rates. Um, so, you know, I mean, could, basically all I'm saying is could the market fall another 10 or 20 percent from here? And that answer is yes. Uh, I'm not saying it will. I'm not saying it should or I think it will. But it can uh, if you're willing to take heat on it in the short term and hold it for the next 10 years. I mean, I don't think you can possibly make a mistake doing that. Yeah, obviously, there are caveats to this, listeners. Uh, it's not a free lunch trade. You're obviously, you're not just collecting $2,000 in our example. You're setting aside over $300,000. That's capital you can't use for other trading. So there is an opportunity cost to this. So just be aware of that. It's not free money. And obviously, we can continue to sell off. So make sure, we always say this, but make sure when you're selling these puts, these are levels where you're actually comfortable maybe picking up 
a little bit of whatever underlying you're selling the puts on. Could be uh, maybe Bitto out there right now. Could be Spy. Could be Robin Hood. Pick your poison. Whatever is floating your boat out there. But yeah, in general, this approach, if you do it diligently and systematically and you haven't been doing it since the top of the markets, then it certainly can serve you well over the long term. Uh, that music, listeners, means we've come to the end of another epic episode of Options Bootcamp. Man, what an episode we had today. We had epic giveaways. We had uh, spy puts. We had uh, crazy lizards. <laughs> we had uh, all sorts of crypto drama. Damn, we did a lot of living on the show today. If folks want to reach out to you and do some more living after the show, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Make your way on over to Markets taker.com to tease in a row and um you know if you click join free it puts you on our uh email list and we send you only important emails one of which is going to be an invitation to this saturday's training webinar on um, momentum trade so i hope you'll join us for that and hey we'd love to hear from you anyway there you go. Check him out over there in the land of the taker. All rainbows and unicorns, he says over there. So check it out for yourselves. Market Taker. Two Ts.com is the place to go. Of course, you know where to go to check out all of the great stuff we're talking about on the pro side, the options insider.com slash pro. Or for you cool fans, you cool listeners of OBC slash secret club. Stay safe out there, listeners. These are literally crazy markets we are living through all again. And we'll be back here next week to talk you off the ledge. Another episode of Options Bootcamp. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>